Hey HMS Monitors, this is Mike Bartles from the Hydrologic Engineering Center. In this video, we're going to continue discussing routing methods within HEC HMS by talking about the Muskingum routing method. A good bit of material from this lecture was originally developed by Gary Bruner, who's also from HEC. By the end of this lecture, you should be familiar with the Muskingum routing method. I'll present an example computation, and we'll discuss pr common parameter estimation techniques and calibration techniques. Finally, we'll finish up by comparing advantages and disadvantages when using this method. Routing in natural rivers is complicated by the fact that storage in a river reach is not a function of outflow alone. That's because the water surface in a channel during the passage of a flood wave is not uniform. The storage and water surface slope within a river reach for a given outflow is greater during the rising stages of a flood wave than during the falling stages. Therefore, the relationship between storage and discharge at the outlet of a channel is not a unique relationship. Rather, it's a looped relationship, as shown in the figure on the right. The Muskingum method was developed in an attempt to, to accommodate this looped relationship. Within the Muskingum method, storage within a reach is visualized in two parts, prism and wedge storage. In the example image, prism storage is shown in red, and wedge storage is shown in green. During the rising stages of the flood wave, the wedge storage is positive and added to the prism storage. This situation is depicted in the left-hand image. Here's prism storage, and here's wedge storage during the rising limb. Conversely, during the falling stages of a flood wave, the wedge storage is negative and subtracted from the prism storage. The situation is depicted in the right-hand image. Here's prism storage again, and here's wedge storage during the falling limb. Let's go back to the continuity and momentum equations. The Muskingum method starts by simplifying the continuity equation to inflow minus outflow equals change in storage over time. The momentum equation is replaced with a relationship relating storage in the reach and discharge at the outlet. These simplifications make the method simple to parameterize and solve, but they also limit its applicability. In particular, attenuation is handled numerically and isn't related to any physically measurable characteristics of the reach. And because the momentum equation is replaced, this method cannot simulate backwater effects. Also, this method is best applied to steep streams with slopes greater than two feet per mile and slowly rising hydrographs. This method requires an initial condition and three parameters, k, x, and number of subreaches. k, x, and number of subreaches are constant throughout time, so this method cannot simulate variable translation and attenuation. This example shows how an inflow hydrograph shown in blue is translated and attenuated to produce the outflow hydrograph shown in black. The inflow hydrograph is uniformly translated in time by 7.5 hours, which is controlled by and equivalent to the k parameter. I gotta stress the uniformly translated portion of what I just said. All points along the curve are translated by that much. The peak, the centroid of mass, everything. The peak of the inflow hydrograph is reduced by 120 CFS, which is controlled by the X parameter and number of subreaches. When estimating an appropriate K, three approaches can be used. The first approach uses observed data at the start and end of the reach to directly compute the travel time. This approach is depicted in the right-hand image. You can use the elapsed time between centroid of areas of the two hydrographs, between the right hydrograph peaks, or between midpoints of the rising limbs. However, it's usually a rare occurrence that observed data is available at both the upstream and downstream end of the reach, so this approach isn't too common. The second approach to estimate K uses a computed flood wave velocity and flow length to infer a travel time, and this approach is more commonly used and we'll explore more on the next slide. Finally, regression equations relating parameters like slope, or roughness and length are available in some regions that can be used to infer this parameter. A value for k can be estimated as the travel time of the flood wave through the routing reach. The flood wave velocity can be estimated using Manning's equation or the Clyte Sutton law. The Clyte Sutton law allows you to approximate flood wave velocity from a stage flow rating curve at a representative location for the routing reach. This method requires you to estimate the slope of the rating curve and the top width, both at the flow rate of interest. In the image to the right, the flow rate of interest is 10,000 CFS. The slope at this point can then be estimated. The top width must also be estimated for this flow rate using aerial photos, field surveys, or backwater calculations. X is a dimensionless coefficient that controls attenuation. As I mentioned before, since attenuation is numerical when using this method, this parameter lacks a strong physical meaning and can't be easily estimated from physical characteristics of the reach. However, x must be between 0 and 0 0.5. When x equals 0, storage becomes solely a function of outflow 
and this results in the maximum amount of attenuation. When x equals 0 0.5, storage is equally weighted between inflow and outflow, and no attenuation will be simulated. And typically, I set x equal to 0 0.25, and then calibrate using observed data. The Muskingum routing method has a constraint related to the relationship between the parameter k and the computation interval. Ideally, the two should be equal, but the computation interval should not be less than 2 times k times x to avoid instabilities. A long routing reach should be subdivided into subreaches so that the travel time through each subreach is approximately equal to the routing computational interval. This assumes that factors such as channel geometry and roughness have been taken into consideration when estimating k. To initially estimate this parameter, divide your estimate of k by the computational time interval. However, this parameter also acts to produce attenuation, so it can be modified during calibration. When calibrating the Muskingum method, I like to start by modifying my initial estimate of k to best match the rising limb of the observed hydrograph. Then I modify x and number of subreaches in an attempt to match the observed peak flow rate. In this example, observed flow is shown in black and computed flow is shown in solid blue. I've matched the rising limb decently well, but my computed peak discharge is too high, so I need to decrease my x parameter and or the number of subreaches. Remember to use multiple statistical metrics to gauge whether your model is accurate. The main advantage of this method is that it's simple. Because it's simple, it's been successfully used all over the world for numerous types of applications. Also, this method is parsimonious in that a small number of variables or parameters are used to explain something which allows for easy investigation of model uncertainty. However, the primary disadvantage of this method is also that it's simple. This method also cannot simulate variable translation and attenuation effects. You only get one go by defining a constant k, x, and number of subreaches for a simulation. In review, I introduced the Muskingum routing method. This is a simple to use and parameterized method within HEC HMS. However, its simplicity is also its disadvantage for complicated scenarios. In the next video, we'll delve into the Muskingum Cones routing method, which is an improvement over the Muskingum method. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.